Morning and welcome everybody. My name is Alice Nicholson, Policy and Improvement Officer. Actually, your first item of business today, uh, you'll see the chair is vacant, is an appointment of a chair for today's meeting. Unfortunately, um, Jo Otten's not able to be here, um, so I'm now opening up and asking you for a nomination for chair for the meeting today. Mark. Could I nominate Mike Chaplin? Any seconders, please? Unlucky, Mike. Can I just check? There's no, no contest, so Mike is in the chair. Councillor Mike Chaplin is in the chair today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, uh, for, for your patience um, and for coming here today. Uh, as um, Alice allu alluded to just now, um, Councillor Joe Otten has, has been poorly. Um, he is on the mend, thankfully, so we'll look forward to seeing him chair this meeting in, in September. The meeting today is open to the public. We have received questions from nine members of the public and a petition referred from council. Please can I request that mobile telephones and other such equipment are switched to silent mode so as not to disturb the conduct of the meeting. There is no fire test plan for today. If there is an emergency evacuation, please take instruction from the town hall staff. The assembly point is in Tudor Square. Um, so you all now know that I'm Councillor Mike Chaplin, for Southy, I'm Councillor for Southie Ward. I'm going to go around the room and ask um, people to introduce themselves. Let's start with yourself moving round to the to the left then. Please. Thank Sarah. you, Chair. Um, good morning everyone. My name is Sarah Bennett and I'm Assistant Director of Legal and Governance. Good morning everyone. My name is Ashwan Ali and I'm the Executive Director of Operational Services. Morning everyone, I'm Richard Eyre, I'm the Director of Streets and Regulation. Good morning, I'm Barbara Masters, Councillor for Ecclesaw and substitute for Councillor Joe Watton. Hi, I'm Councillor Tim Hagen, I'm Councillor for Crooks and Crosspool. Hi, I'm Councillor Mark Jones, Councillor for Boone Creek Ward. Councillor Bina Maulana, I'm Councillor for Park and Arbor uh, Good morning everyone, I'm Clive Stevenson from the Licensing Service. I'm Claire Bauer, Service Manager of Licensing Service. Good morning, Craig Harper from the Licensing Service. Good morning, Jill Charles, Head of Waste Management. Neil Tambro, Waste Management Officer. Ian Ashmore, Head of Environmental Regulation. Good morning, Councillor Janet Riddler, Councillor for Stocksbridge and Upper Don. Uh, Councillor Paul Turpin, one of the Green Councillors from Gleeglas Valley. Councillor Cliff Woodcraft, elected member for Fullwood. Councillor Alexi Diamond, uh, Green Councillor for Cleveland Valley as well. Thank you. Morning everyone, I'm Ryan Keyworth, I'm the Council Director of Finance and Commercial Services. Um, I'm Alice Nicholson, Policy and Improvement Officer, supporting this committee. Thank you. Um, can I introduce Claire here, who is making sure that we are being broadcast live on the internet and that our uh, <coughs> communications within the chamber are working. So without you, <laughs> this doesn't happen. Um, 
I must now ask for apologies for absence, and I would take it that Jo Otten is, uh, is the only one. Yeah. Um, are there any exclusions of the uh, press and public? There are no items excluded. Uh, are there any declarations of interest? I take it there are no declarations of interest from members. So we now move to item five, public questions and petitions. We have received questions from nine members of the public. Some are unable to attend and have asked that these be read out. For ease, we will move the asking and reading of public questions on taxi licensing policy and matters to the start of item nine. Is there any dissent to that approach? In that case, we will consider the petition referred from Council on the condition of Sheldon Road pavements under the work programme item. So on public questions. Hello, Brid Bridget Ingle, would you like to oh, you, did read you want your to question? Oh, did you want oh, me to sorry. talk about the petition? Petition first. No. Oh, sorry, Chair, the mic. Is that the um, Sheldon Road? Yes. Um, the committee will consider that under the work Thank programme you. item. Um, can Sheffield City Council review its city centre waste management strategy for apartment buildings and landlords responsible for multi-occupational properties? Bin stores are not used properly, contaminated and overfull bins are not emptied, household rubbish is then piled up in the bin stores and on the street. The household rubbish on the street then becomes Amy's responsibility to clear up. The earlier has limited powers, which, which means the burden of responsibility falls on environmental protection services to take the enforcement action. EPS do not have the resources to deal with all the problems which are being created through management companies and landlords not managing their properties correctly. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Bridget, for that, for that question. Do any of the officers present wish to respond to her question? Chair, I can uh, offer a response. I've drafted a response for the committee chair, Councillor Jo Watson. Um, but thank you for the question, Bridget, and the point you raised. Um, the fact of the matter is that the Environmental Protection Act is how um, the legislation works about prescribing how householders present waste. And that falls down to um, those individuals that present waste and not landlords and managing agents. So we do have a problem in trying to enforce through management uh, agents and landlords. Um, but from the work uh, that I know personally you've undertaken and you provided examples of, um, I agree that we should review our policy with Veolia and look if we can uh, improve our lines of communication back to those uh, landlords and managing agents to try and reduce the actual problem for residents in those blocks. So that's what we're going to do. We've got to work within the confines of the existing legislation, but we will definitely look at the management practice with Veolia following the comments you've made. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jill. We have another, que we have another question. Um, yes, Chair, there were a number of questions submitted um, that people weren't able to attend and um, they were, have asked that 
um, I read them out, and if that's all right with you, Chair, I'll just I'll just read read them through, um, for the record. Um, so one's from Sheffield Chef Food Partnership, asking in response to the recent national food strategy, does the council have a plan to implement the national government policy to implement free weekly separate food waste collections for all households from 2025? If so, is there any intention for this compost to be used between community growing groups in the city as seen amongst other cities in the country? Um, yeah. Jill, are you able to provide a response on that one? Of course, yeah. Um, the agenda item today is bringing a uh, food waste trial um, approval report. So in the report that explains the preparations we are making to roll out a free weekly food waste collection in Sheffield um, as per the requirements of the Environment Act. We expect that to be a requirement from 2025, but we are pending uh, government funding for how we deliver that service. So we are very actively modelling that in the background and the, the food waste trial, the report that we've brought today is to help give us further intelligence on that. In regard to the further supplementary bit about can the uh, material collected be given back to groups, um, I, I don't have an answer on that specifically. Um, this material has to be treated um, at high temperature through anaerobic digestion to ensure pathogens and um, uh, the germs within the waste are broken down and are safe, we would have to look at whether there is a mechanism for that processor to enable that material to come back to uh, groups in Sheffield. So I don't have a specific answer on that. Chair, if I might. Um, the other question, there's two other questions which I will read out that are not related to each other, um, but they're not part of taxi licensing either. So there was a question from um, Sean Clark on behalf of the Moor Market Traders. Unfortunately, nobody was able to attend um, as they're, they're, they're working. The Moor Market Traders would like to wish the Waste and Street Scene Policy Committee well in this new way of operating and hope that the Moor Market appears high on every agenda for regular discussion, improvement and comment, despite the fact that some council committees can sometimes be accused of being slow, indecisive and unresponsive. We have initial confidence, having met with Joe Otten recently, that you will be a modern dynamic committee who will respond quickly and positively to the challenges ahead. The, there's a little bit more to it, but it then moves on to um, two very specific questions. For you as committee, um, will the policy committee please commit to helping create and operate a clear and realistic improvement plan and investment budget that is urgently needed to help us make the market a celebrated world-class facility? And will the policy committee please highlight and recognise the importance of the more market to Sheffield City Council and make plans and investments that will generate a better future for all traders, guaranteeing a better return for the council and most importantly for the people of Sheffield. Um, and then the other question I have here that I'll read out um, and then Chair, you might want to see if you can get answers um, today, is from Paul Stead who says that in April 2021, Mark Jones, the cabinet member responsible for street scene, announced that Sheffield City Council would be integrating their online reporting system with Fix My Street. This is a far superior system and will save the council money. Given the financial pressures the council are under, why has Fix My Street system not been implemented? If I can respond to the, to the first, first one, I think that would be better with a written reply. Um, I'm, I'm mindful of the time. On the second one, I would hope that's something we can tease out when we can come to item 10 and the plan for 500,000 500, budget amendment for street scene improvements because I did see something in the paper there that covered that off. Um, I know that Jill has to leave us uh, fairly soon for a hospital appointment. Um, so I'm just concerned about item, item six, the appointment of deputy chair of the, of the committee. We can move, we can move that. Yeah. Uh, so 
if we're finished with the questions for now, yeah, we could then go to item seven, food waste, um, the food waste trial. And I appreciate you coming along today because it can't have been difficult, can't have been easy getting, getting here, Jill. Um, so the floor is yours. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, apologies, I do need to disappear. Um, hopefully I can get this boot off today, fingers crossed. I don't want to miss that appointment. Um, my colleague, Neil Town Road, to my left, is here to pick up um, when I leave. And, and Neil is even more expert on this than I am, so you're in very safe hands of taking us through this item. Uh, so, to explain, we've brought to you a uh, report um, of a proposal for a food waste collection trial for the city. Um, as outlined in section one, uh, the Environment Act um, became law last year and places a new legal requirement on all councils who are responsible for collecting waste to collect food waste separately and weekly. There's no timescales given to that specifically yet. We are waiting for further government consultation on this, but it is anticipated that that rollout would be from 2025. 50% um, of councils, roughly, across the UK uh, currently provide some sort of food waste collection. Some councils collect it with garden waste and actually only collect it fortnightly, whilst others do do a, a, a single food waste collection on a weekly basis. Section 1.2 of the report explains that we are actively trying to model what this uh, new service could look like in Sheffield with Veolia because we are in the integrated waste management contract with them and they would deliver the service on our behalf. We also explain that we need confirmation from government of the additional funding for this new legal requirement to be able to roll this service out. Um, you'll hear later on the budget report the, the financial uh, constraints that the council is operating under and it's it's imperative that we secure additional funding uh, for this service rather than try and accommodate it within our existing uh, funding. Section 1.3 of the report explains the basis of the trial, so the parameters in which we're seeking to operate. We're looking to provide the trial to around 8,000 households and as a weekly collection service um, we are looking to operate for four days a week so that the fifth day enables us to ensure that we can recover any missed collections or deal with any service issues that are arising, because this is new uh, for us and for Veolia. So we are looking for 8,000 households, uh, roughly 2,000 a day um, across the four days. In Appendix 4, which we'll come to shortly, we have given you some options about um, the areas for inclusion in the trial. And we are suggesting we would either run from Monday to Thursday or Tuesday to Friday. Our recommendation is based on aligning the food waste collection day to, you, to a bin collection day. Because the evidence from uh, providers who already do this is that's how you get the most participation. It's too confusing for some customers if you have a separate day to remember to put your food waste out as well as your bin day. So that's the basis of the information we've put in front of you. Um, the food waste trial would run for a 12-week period. It will be a start and finish uh, because we don't have infinite funding to continue this. 50% of, of the costs of the service are going to be contributed from Veolia and they will pay for the, the revenue element. So providing the collection vehicle and the collection resource and the supervision and the overhead, uh, the support through the call centre, etc. And the council is contributing the funding for the caddies. Uh, because we would be able to take these forward into a new service in the future also. We'll also pay for the uh, communications cost directly from the council, and that's from the underspend that's forecast in the existing waste management budget this year. We have secured local handling um, at a plant at Beely Wood. This would act as a transfer, so it, it's already operating as a depackaging plant, so it takes uh, food waste from commercial sources, strips of packaging, and then they take it onto their processing facilities in East, Yorkshire. Um, so we've been able to access that facility to take the waste. Um, as I've explained, it's a 12-week start and finish, so we will conclude the service um, towards uh, the beginning of December, so it doesn't overlap with, with Christmas collections. And we've also included some parameters of the evaluation of the trial within the report. So hopefully that gives you sufficient overview of how uh, the service will work. Two caddies will be provided to each household. 
So one for you to use in your home, inside your kitchen, and store your waste in, and a separate caddy to put out at the curbside on a weekly basis for collection. We're also um, recommending we provide li liners uh, for the caddies. Again, for, uh, the national findings are that services are more supported when customers are given liners to keep the caddy clean. Uh, so we are going with that recommendation. If I take you now to Appendix 4 of the report, um, these are the collection rounds that we are seeking your recommendation for approval of which, which round you would like to uh, see accommodated within the trial. So we've given you a breakdown uh, from Monday to Friday. Um, the selection of these rounds is to be representative of Sheffield households. That's the basis of, of why we've recommended these rounds so that we can get the most learning from providing this service to those households. Officers' recommendation would be to opt for a Tuesday to Friday service. We would like to offer the service, particularly to Friday collections, which are classed as financially stretched communities. National learning is that these are the hardest groups for us actually to engage, both with recycling and food waste collections, and we feel that we could learn the most from this trial. The uh, contrary part to that is that means we wouldn't collect on Monday um, and Mondays are the parts of the city where we could actually expect the most yield, the most amount of food waste potentially to come out. So it's a compromise of do we go for highest amount of volume to get through the trial or do we go for really understanding the issues that will be presented to us when we roll this out across the city and that's a decision that's, that's in front of, of you today to, to make. Uh, so. The um, chair, the process will be to run a vote um, through yourself on the recommendations. So I think the first vote is to either agree that the service would run Monday to Thursday or Tuesday to Friday, and then subsequent votes on each of the options for each of the days, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you for that, Jill. Um, so, I have a number. So I've just cut myself off again. Um, yeah, I've got a number of hands have gone up during the presentation. Um, so I'll take questions in the order I've seen those hands. And the first one is Mark Jones. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks for that, Julian. I'm really pleased to see this coming forward. I know you've been working on this for quite a long time. Um, I'm still frustrated that government has yet to give us the money or shoot the gun to say when we can actually start this race because it feels like they're looking for us to blink first and take the expense on ourselves so we won't get compensated later. So uh, I know you guys have toughed out a lot of abuse for not already implementing this, um, So, but well done for bringing this forward. Um, I have a couple of things that I, th I think we do need to touch on. Um, looking at the way the plan's going forward and the Tuesday to Friday options and such like, one bit I am concerned about is um, if we get areas that are non-compliant, um, we can learn lessons from that, um, but then we may wind up getting subject to criticisms of failing to deliver this and deliberately gerrymandering the process so it doesn't look like it goes forward and it can work. So any thoughts you've got on that would be good. I've, also, I've got a list of questions. I'll try and stick to the per most pertinent ones. Um, the other thing is, is that though we've got um, areas by um, economic circumstances and such like, we've not necessarily got groupings here in terms of urban challenges such as high-rise buildings and, and the rest. It, it, it's more kind of like down to the financial capacities of, of the communities rather than the properties in which they live. Um, which of these options do you think gives us the most um, complete view of what it's like to collect bins from really tight uh, terraces up, up to flats as well as those in more leafier suburbs where they've got capacity to store bins. Um, also, touching on from one of the questions at the beginning, uh, yeah, uh, I, I can understand why we would look to uh, ship our waste initially somewhere else because we haven't got the capacity here. When do we think, or as Veolia indicated, when they think we could actually have anaerobic digesters working in Sheffield as soon as possible? Um, when could they deliver on that element of it? And touching on the question from earlier specifically, 
Um, if we're going to have anaerobic digesters, which make a lot of sense, we can capture some of the elements of that for heat and power and everything else. But is there um, yet a conclusive, um, well thought out process for disposing of both the liquid and solid waste from those uh, digesters? As you mentioned, they're going to need to be subject to pasteurisation to get rid of uh, any contaminants that may be in there, biological and otherwise. Um, but is there is there a market established for that waste? Because it is the right thing to do to us go forward, but if we, we, if we just merely displace one waste form for another waste form, we're then having the unintended consequences of creating more problems subsequent to that. So uh, quite a lot there to cover. So I'll stop there. I could go on for hours, but I'll not. You'll be pleased. And, and who did you kick to get it to open the door? <laughs> I don't have to answer that one. Thank you. <laughs> do you want do you want to respond to that? Uh, yes, I can do. Um, in terms of the um, not making the service work, I think was the first point. Um, it's, it doesn't. We've got to make the service work because it's going to be a statutory requirement. So we have to have this service in the city, and it's when we're deploying vehicles and collection crews, it's in our interest as a city to make sure that they are fulfilled. Um, so that's the idea that we would get some learning from these financially challenged areas that we can learn more from than if we went into areas just with high yield. But, but that is the decision um, for the committee to take because there are pros and cons to that, as you've illustrated. Um, in terms of the urban challenge bit about high rise, we have secured a commitment from Veolia that we would um, seek to add some flats onto each day. So we wouldn't be going for really high-rise blocks because they present massive challenges about where you present the caddies and bringing caddies down from 11 floors. But we will be accommodating maisonettes and low-rise flats within each day for each round. So there will, there will be some learning on that. In terms of the development facility for, for, uh, of AD for Sheffield, as this is a trial, it, it's really good that we've been able to secure sort of sub-regional processing um, so, that, so that's good. We're not going to get a lot of um, vehicle miles in terms of, of processing that waste. So that is a good result. And it, it, you know, it means this, this trial can be a reality. The, the points you raised are exactly the challenges about securing AD in Sheffield. Who takes the off, the off products from, from the whole process? And how do they um, get utilised fully? And, and in going to an existing facility, that's all been wrapped up. You know, and there's a reason why it's in East Yorkshire. It's because it's a, an agricultural-based um, area. So there is demand for those products. So all the issues that you raised and the opportunity potentially to generate AD gas and, and heat the district energy network is, is absolutely the, the work that we are continuing to do with Veolia. Um, the problem is Sheffield on its own will not produce enough food waste to justify its own plant. So there would need to be some form of regional working to secure a plant for Sheffield or more waste being brought into Sheffield to be processed specifically for that. Hopefully that covers the points. Thank you, Jill. Tim, you have a question. Yeah, I was going to ask about, um, you know, our, as part of our commitment to um, circular economy, because obviously with the crisis in Ukraine and fertiliser being something <coughs> not directly impacted, uh, one of my questions is, are you working closely with Veolia to make sure that any anaerobic digester, because Mark's alluded to this, is, um, is fit for purpose so that we, in any, in, in any you know, regional partnership, which is a good thing, to make sure we've got the optimum amount of food waste that can be then uh, utilised, that can be then turned into fertiliser, that do, do all the other things that we want to use with our waste as part of a circular economy. How are we working with Veolia? Have we entered into discussions with other councillors councils about how this may work? Uh, is, is the first question. The other, the other thing is, when I was looking at the picture of your bins, the actual, uh, the 23 litre bin, um, they are twist lockable, aren't they? Because they need to be, otherwise this will fail rather rapidly this this um, as people try to take them out for collection they spill over the animals get into them that sort of thing so so I couldn't quite see with the picture graphic that we've got on that and so that's sort of the the other end of the scale that I'm asking about 
that for, for, for this and just to make sure that we have put that into place because that is something that is, that is vital. I've seen it in other councils, you see, uh, where some are lockable and some aren't, and the ones that aren't lockable tend to be the ones where there has to be a, a, quite a quick reinvestment in different kit that they hadn't had in the first place. So yes, to confirm, um, we should have brought one with us. We were just saying you, you when you lift the handle, it does drop the handle, it locks it off. It's like a little plastic mechanism on the side that just locks it off, which I think is what you'd be getting at. And I think it's on both of them, to be fair, but we'll, we'll, we'll definitely check on a five litre, but yes, that, that, yeah, <laughs> that, that's fine. Um, in terms of the um, sourcing waste for an AD plan and that, that closed loop element, um, those are all things that we are in early discussions about. Um, the We are part of South Yorkshire Waste Partnership, so there is the opportunity potentially to uh, look at joint infrastructure, um, and it, it's something the committee will need to think about how we take forward with our regional partners, uh, sub-regional partners on, on that. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Um, Paul? got you next. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, this is really good, really support this trial. Really optimistic about it. I do have a few questions. Um, it's, you claim that it will reduce carbon, but there hasn't been an impact, uh, a climate impact assessment done on this. So I, I, I think you, know, you can't claim that and without having done that assessment. And also that assessment needs to be done. Uh, particularly as there will be quite a lot of travel um, around the city and up to North Yorkshire or wherever the, the digester is. Um, and also take the, that, taking into account that food waste isn't fossil CO2, so, you know, I'd quite like to see that work done. Um, the, it's, you say that the caddies are made it from closed loop recycled plastic, so are you saying that they're made from bottles we've collected in Sheffield? Um, the bags, you say, ooh, you say the bags are plastic. Um, the bags that they use for the food waste service in Wales is, are compostable. And, uh, you know, so A, not a single-use plastic, and, and B, you, you take out that part of the system where you're removing or, or saying that you'll remove the bags. Um, yep. Yeah. That's it. Thank you, Paul. Jill, do you want to uh, yes. um, respond So, to that? in terms of carbon impact, um, we explained that we haven't got the resource, well, we haven't explained in the report, we don't have the resource to do the carbon impact specifically on this trial. You know, it's a small scale trial. What we have explained is that we have had some modelling uh, for Barnsley, Doncaster, Rotherham, and Sheffield as part of the South Yorkshire Waste Partnership. Um, to understand the carbon benefit of food waste collections, and that does give a positive um, benefit of, of carbon reduction compared to our existing treatment. And a lot of the time, um, the carbon benefits of food waste collection are based on landfill, and that isn't the case for us in Sheffield. So the evidence that we have got on, on a whole-scale rollout, which was modelled by local partnerships, is that there will still be uh, some carbon benefit for us for doing separate collections. But there were some assumptions in that about how far we were taking the waste to be treated. Um, and did we model it on electric vehicles? No. But we did model that on, on, on diesel vehicles. We are working with Veolia to try and secure electric vehicles as we go forward. You know, so that is one of the ways that we can really um, offset the, the increased potential carbon from, from more vehicle movements in the city. And actually, food waste collections are quite well suited to um, electric vehicles because you don't collect a lot of material, it's quite light, it's not big HGV frames. So that hopefully that answers that, that question. In terms of closed loop plastics, I can't guarantee that the, the material collected in Sheffield has gone back into those caddies. I don't have the level of transparency on that closed loop. What we are told by our supplier is that the, it is a closed loop um, product in that they are using uh, recycled material to make those caddies. Um, quite often they are from um, old uh, refuse collection bins, old, old wheel bins, and they're recycling them into the caddies. Uh, and in terms of the bags, Neil just said to me that our, our, our liners are indeed closed compostable too. 
they are compostable. So can you just clarify why there, again why there hasn't been a, a climate impact assessment because it's it's on all of the decisions now you know it's on the form it's even is it you Neil are you assigned to that role in this one I imagine <coughs> we've used the fact that we, because the local partnerships modeling indicates that when we do a full scale rollout there is a carbon benefit that's that's the basis that we use for the climate implications on this report rather than doing a specific impact assessment to this prime. I, I just don't see why that we, we couldn't do one. You know, it's that all, all decisions now have that element on the on the document and really it seems like a, you know some some uh, things that will come through the committee might be more difficult to see why you would do a climate impact assessment but I think this is a really good example and as the and as the tool is pretty new it would also be quite useful for the council for learning to to have done that work with the sustainability team. We can do one retrospectively, not a problem. I think we just feel that there was going to be limited value because potentially it is a very small trial and actually it, it doesn't scale up. In, in the same way, especially if we are going to try and secure electric vehicles. Yeah, th thank you for that, Jill. Um, <clears throat> um, that, se that seems clear to me. Uh, you should be able to gather the evidence as you go along and then use that for in preparation for when we do roll this out citywide. Uh, can I come on to Alex? Alexi next. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you, Gillian, and the officers for the report and all the work that's gone into that. It's also really excited for the food waste trial. Um, I think most of my questions have actually already been asked by other people, but I've got um, a, a few follow-on questions. Just um, to query why high-rise blocks have not been included in the trial. I understand it's difficult, but surely that would provide then some good data about how we're going to manage that. Uh, and it is, um, no, from my word, like um, waste management in those high-rise blocks. It is a challenge already, so it might have been good to get some data from that. So just something about the rationale for not. Um, and then also, um, I understand now why that you couldn't have gone with a, any, there isn't a local provider that could have taken the, uh, done the anaerobic um, respiration, but was there a tendering process that, um, uh, basis for the decision to apply tip for getting that contract um, to do that and um, we said that Sheffield doesn't produce enough food waste to have a, its own anaerobic respiration facility but would South Yorkshire as a whole uh, I don't know if you both can answer that question uh, so in terms of the high-rise question specifically I think we want to do more research with other um, cities and towns that have got high-rises and have actually made it work. Our anecdotal um, findings at the moment is that there's been very little success. And so we didn't want to have a huge investment of rolling out caddies, two caddies to every property in a high rise for us to have very, very limited success. So it, it was a balance of risk with this. And there is some more learning that we can do from areas where um, food waste is, in, is happening with high rise. Um, so hopefully that covers that one. Um, in terms of the uh, question about tendering for biotech for um, Veolia have exclusivity over our waste. So it's Veolia who secure, secured um, that outlet for us. So there is no tendering um, process uh, for, for biotech in, in that way. And oh, sorry, I've forgotten the last question. Sorry. Sorry, it's just about, um, you said before that Sheffield wouldn't produce enough food waste. Uh, but with South Yorkshire as a whole, and is that something we could look at developing a partnership with other councils yeah, or okay. the city region? I think um, whilst um, we have good data, or relatively good data and, and knowledge on household waste streams, um, because we manage that waste directly, so we know roughly what we could expect to see from the household waste stream. The unknown bit is, is the commercial fraction and, and what opportunity that presents to then develop a sort of South Yorkshire facility. 
So yes, in theory, between uh, South Yorkshire councils, we would have enough for a small scale facility, but it would still need to be supplemented by some commercial material going in. And actually, the more commercial material you can attract, the more benefit you get from a, a bigger plant. Just that clarifies. Thank you, Jill. Um, Barbara, you're, you're next. Thank you, Chair. Um, sort of, the waste is going to be taken to Hillsborough in the first instance. Now, um, are there issues involved with that collection point already? Because I'm concerned that we all want waste collection to be successful. And it's not just the collection process, it's actually the, the processing afterwards. So is that going to be monitored to ensure that sort of any lessons learned from maybe sort of traffic movements or sort of uh, concerns of residents will be sort of also uh, evaluated so that any future facility, all this can be incorporated to, so that we don't um, you know, cause uh, uh, dissension within the whole Sheffield community? Okay, um, the facility has planning permission to um, accept far in excess deliveries of what we will be taking in. We are literally be taking in one load a day on a, on a relatively small vehicle. Um, if we rolled out the, the scheme to the whole city and we still wanted to use that site, it would still be within the parameters of their existing planning permission. And if you're familiar with the site, it is an old uh, brownfield site. Um, so there should be minimal local impact to residents um, in terms of accessing that site. So we don't, we don't anticipate there being any issues from the trial because it is so small scale. And in terms of scaling up, if we did continue to use that site for a full city rollout, it would still be within the parameters that, uh, of the planning bid that the site has currently got. Now, can I just check that you, are, you have got a process in place that sort of you can address concerns of any residents because we know full well that sort of when the rumour mill starts working, that sort of it's suddenly a huge facility with all sorts of problems, and it's just a case of nipping things in the bud, but to make sure that residents go along with us as opposed to sort of set up um, barriers. Yes, of course. Uh, Biotech are, are a, a national leader. Um, they recently took over that plant in Hillsborough. It was under a, a more localised management. So Biotech have taken over the plant. They're a national leader in this provision. Uh, Veolia have undertaken a compliance check, so we've checked all the planning permissions, we've checked all their uh, environment agency compliance, their health and safety records, etc. So there has been a tight piece of compliance work there, and if there are uh, local complaints, we will of course respond to those. Chair, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to hand over to my colleague Neil now to take any further questions and, and talk the, the committee through appendix four because I do need to leave. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jill, for, for coming along. And sorry we couldn't give you more time today. And uh, I hope you get properly sorted out at hospital. Mark, you have a, a question. Thank you, Chair, for letting me come back in. Um, one of the things that you have raised here is uh, sustainability of the food collection going forward. Now, considering that... Um, I think it's still the case, I might be wrong now, our um, green waste, um, thanks Jill, good luck, uh, our, our garden waste uh, currently goes to composting, which is out in the open, uh, releasing significant amounts of methane, and we've just had a report that if we suppress methane production, we can actually maybe get ahead of the curve on climate change, maybe. Um, so, Considering that a lot of the garden waste is not dissimilar to the food waste, could we look to blend some of that garden waste into that to make it sustainable? Should that be the outcome of the trial? Is that part of our thinking currently? Or, or is that something we could investigate with Veolia going forward to see if that is a, a strategy we could use to make sure that that food waste, should, more than anything, we, none of us want to be seeing waste going in the bin. Uh, none of us want us to see us buying food that we aren't eating. Uh, most of my waste food in terms of cores of peppers and such that goes into rabbits to turn into food to turn into my garden but we don't want to see lots of food waste but we do want to see this going forward so can we look at alternate creative ways of, of blending waste streams even if it is just garden waste to, to get that bit there um, the other element was and it, and it comes back it somewhat to the high rise um, question about how difficult it is to implement um, waste strategies uh, on, on 
on a city-wide basis. And this comes back to something that I've been particularly mindful of, uh, as parts of uh, challenges that face parts of my ward is, are we in a position now of looking at differential provision of services for the city? At the moment, we've effectively got one size fits all, um, but not everybody is able to uh, utilize the recycling bins uh, as, as well as others for whatever reasons. There's often cross contamination, which means that though you've effectively got weekly bin collection currently, uh, if you cross contaminate your brown and blue bin, then all of a sudden you're going down to a bi weekly. Uh, two, two weekly collection um, because your brown and blue bins out of the equation until it gets reset and that's only done uh, on a couple of occasions so through this strategy and through the, the learnings that we were picking up here and is there a provision to go forward looking at how we can tailor the waste solutions for the individual communities through across our city rather than expecting everyone to be able to just use the one service as it is um, that, that, that is something, I know, I know it's not specifically for this element, but it, it's something that maybe we can look to investigate going forward and as part of the learning of this. Uh, over to you, Neil, and uh, good luck. Um, with regards to the first question, which is, um, I, I interpret it greatly more about collecting the garden waste and putting it together and disposing it combined. Um, there are local authorities that do that um, across the country, um, and the evidence Typically speaking, the, the collection frequency of that material then falls down to every two weeks rather than weekly um, because there's cost elements involved. A, you're collecting a lot more waste or recycling because it's combined. You're paying a higher fee for the disposal of both waste, but the same, same fee, same amount of gate fee per tonne, but it's a much bigger tonnage, so there's a higher cost of all the attributed to it. So therefore, most councils then operate a fortnightly service because that generally is what's needed for the garden waste, which is the bulk of the tonnage rather than the weekly service, which is where the food comes in because of the smells um, and, and waste from that. And the evidence suggests that um, participation in, in recycling of food waste drops if you're not operating a weekly service and also if you're combining it with the garden waste. So there's a, there's a, there's a capture, but also a cost impact of that. Um, there is, obviously with the current garden waste service, there is a charge for providing the service. Government, in its initial consultation, did put forward the potential for what, to require mandate-free collections citywide rather than current chargeable services. Um, we don't know where the government's going with that. We have heard uh, indications that maybe they're taking a back seat on that and maybe allowing a charge, whether it's a maximum charge the councils have to do. That's why we need government com um, confirmation that's come through. Um, but once we get the clarity on that, and we are looking to produce a new waste strategy next year, um, we can have some sort of real sort of evidence on the table really in terms of where we're looking at in terms of services moving forwards, but it has to be considered that there is a yield element associated with food, collecting food waste, fortnightly with garden waste, and there's a cost element attributed to it as well. Um, the second question regarding tailoring services by area, um, flats is one thing, um, and then obviously you've got the issues with high density terraced housing, you've got student populations, you've got issues of re uh, contaminated bins not being emptied. Um, for this purpose of the trial, um, we are going to look at a small number of flats within there, admittedly not high rise, but we are going to be speaking and contacting other councils that are operating food waste collections at flats to understand what their learning is in terms of what the best examples and best success looks like. We'll, we'll gather that information, then we'll be, have a better idea in terms of whether that means for the food service we have to offer more support to residents in flats uh, to be able to use the services moving forwards. Um, in relation to the reset of contaminated bins, residents are entitled to request from the area an emptying of a contaminated blue bin or brown bin every six months, or they can choose to take the, the incorrect items out and present it on the next collection. So the onus is there on the resident to put it right, and we do offer them a facility of correcting it so they're able to use the service moving forwards. Um, that is there. Um, in terms of just generally tailoring services, again, it, it needs to be sort of, uh, the, the services we develop, we're a huge city, um, you know, we deliver services that are good for the city and based on informed um, services elsewhere and what works. Often there are certain issues, you know, we provide a lot of communication support in the student areas, for example, um, because we, we're aware that new students move in, they may not be from Sheffield, 
So they may not necessarily know how to use the bid service when they move in. So therefore, we, each year we invest in comms that go out in their calendars, some, some of the active door knocking to help educate the students on how to use the services. Similarly, in the BME areas, we've done a lot of work in Page Hall. You know, we, we know the problems in Page Hall, but we try to support those, those populations as well. We're translating videos, we're translating materials. Um, but ultimately, we do require the residents to use the services correctly. So you, you can look at tailoring services to an extent, but what does that look like and what does the cost look like as well? Um, yeah, does that answer the question? <laughs> Thank you, Neil. If I could just come back on, on one small thing there, Chair. Um, one thing that I was thinking about when we were doing the local plan um, and, and trying to get that ball rolling is the creation of sustainable communities uh, and what, what they would look like going forward rather than as, as they currently are. And some of those um, city centre proximal sites that will have high density of housing could benefit from uh, communal um, utility services areas as they do in, say, or other places, Spain, for instance, where they'll have a, a communal collection area for, for waste and such like. Certainly, if we go down the route of having caddies, it makes it easier to put it into a, a mass hopper. I, I know that there, there are pitfalls with that approach, but it, it, if that is part of our thinking going forward, it would be quite helpful to actually start using this process now to look at how we could utilise that going forward with our waste streams and everything else, as you say, there's going to be a review. So, so looking at some some of those more creative elements, uh, might, might, I've got something to answer now, it's just something to throw out on the table for, for cons consideration. Thank you, Chair. I'm not, I'm not going to <laughs> insist that the officer replies to that, um, what seemed to me to be basically a statement, Mark. Um, understand where you're coming from. Uh, I've been reminded that this meeting did didn't get underway till quarter past 10 and there will be a guillotine at 12.44. So we really are under um, a time pressure here. Um, Alexi, is, is it a quick question? Yeah, it's okay. I can email Neil or Janine about it. Thank you. I'm going to forego my question as well. Um, because I, I, I do think we have given this a good, a good um, discussion and uh, question and answer session. Um, we, we do need to come to a decision on this um, food waste pilot. And I believe it's in two parts. One part is to determine whether we go for a Monday to Thursday trial or a Tuesday to Friday. If, if I might, Chair, also there are actually two recommendations. One is um, that the committee approves the delivery of this trial, so that's a straightforward. Yeah. And then there's a second recommendation, which is the one that will go to a ballot around which areas, which days, which areas. Will that ballot take place today? Yeah, we'll just do that as, as an alternative to um, a show of hands for um, anyone asking for dissent. Cliff, your hand is raised. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, are we going to be able to make comments as, as our views as to which areas are going to be appropriate for this trial before we take the vote? Um, the vote, will, you'll need to um, decide on which option you're going for, whether it's Monday to Thursday or Tuesday to Friday, and then you'll then, as a committee, need to decide for each of those days, if you can, which areas, because if you look at Appendix 4, and it's the, the plan up in there, it tells you what those, those areas are. Um, I think in terms of reasoning, that's, I'm afraid, Chair, that's probably your discretion and how you wish to play this. I'm sure we will end up doing that by a vote, Cliff. Um, can we... Can we take a decision on the, the officer recommendation that we are, are we all agreed that this trial go ahead? Is there any dissent to that? Then that part is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, so we will now go to a decision on whether we have Monday to Thursday or Tuesday to Friday. Paul, your hand is raised. Thanks, Mike. I uh, sort of query something. Is, is it possible to do, to have Wednesday as the day off instead of Monday or Friday? 
Um, and because the wording underneath the table suggests so selecting this round could act as a substitute for the Monday area, um, which suggests that, we've, that there is an option to select it. Neil, the, Neil. Um, when we had discussions with Viola, yeah, um, it, it, they were very clear and we agreed that basically they would have either the Monday or the Friday off to cover the mop up um, for work during that week and also to review the full week's work uh, from previous. So unfortunately not, it's, it is literally, it's the choice of Monday or Friday. Yes, I didn't think that was helpful leaving that in there really. <laughs> we could have, could have done with that, that sentence removed um, before it came to committee. Um, so do we have a view on which is preferred? Tim, you have your hand raised. Yes, just a slight clarification of this because it was said earlier that it would allow one day to, to go and pick up empty bins. If we're doing Tuesday to Friday, it means that some of these bins will be sitting out over the whole weekend to the Monday to be collected, potentially. And is that an ideal scenario over a weekend to be left out? That's all. Neil, can you uh, respond? Well, um, <coughs> If it was left over the weekend, it's, it's not ideal. Because the waste is left just for a few days, the nature of the food waste, it, it's not long enough to actually cause any, um, any, any serious issues with it in terms of flies, etc. Uh, in the few days. Certainly, Viola have, have, have planned the rounds on the basis that they are very confident to be able to complete the work anyway. It's just a safety net. Um, and it's not just about the, the collection of any remaining bins. It's, it's also about reviewing the week's work as well. Um, how it's gone, looking at tonnages, looking at um, feedback, etc. So it can review and review for the, for the following week. So I take it that can be done just as easily on a Monday as a, as a Friday. Thank you. Can I have a view then on the... <coughs> Sorry, just getting advice. Okay, well, I'm going to be brutal here. Um, can, we <laughs> can I have a show of hands for those who would prefer Monday to Thursday collections? I see three hands raised. Can I see a show of hands for Monday to Friday? Mon Sorry, Tuesday to Friday. <laughs> that that's clearly carried. Yeah. We must make sure that some Lib Dem rounds do <laughs> get selected amongst the uh, Tuesday to Friday ones. Bear with. Yeah, if if you if you've not already alighted, if you've not already alighted on it, um, page thirty-five actually has, which is appendix four, has the area options, and there are maps following on from that. Um, you will you will see when you look at the maps, there are there are a number of ones where one ward is named, but it it does carry across into into a second ward. Um, if I can take an example on um, <coughs> category number five, if you look at Thursday option two, where it says pass and cross Southy Green and Longley, um, I can see from the map that it includes a, a part of Southy Ward as well as Firth Park. And, but you will see that elsewhere um, on the other maps. So you've got some rounds which are only in one ward and some rounds which cut across two. Okay. 
Okay, so if you go to page 35, um, and look at the Tuesday's options, can I have a show of hands for option one, Woodseats, Norton Lees, and Mearsbrook? That's five for that one. Sorry, how, how many options can we actually choose on this bit here? Because it's got a mix of one, two, and three. Do we have to choose one option out of the on, on offer? It's one per day, so you would... <coughs> so can I see a show of hands for option two? Hillsborough, Middlewood, Malin Bridge, and Wisewood. Okay, I think that means option one has carried. So we go to Wednesday, uh, which is right at the bottom. Not sure why it was done that way. Option one, Chapeltown, Ecclesfield, and Burn Cross. Can I see a show of hands for that area? That's looking pretty good. Does, is anyone choosing? That was the majority of the people here. Do you want me to go to the other two? It will, it will show a smaller number. <laughs> yes, it was, it was, yeah, it was practically unanimous. We don't need to carry on. So moving to Thursday, we've got option one is for Arbathorn and Gleeless Valley. taken a decision here. And option two, Parson Cross, Sally Green, Longley. One for that. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> and lastly, we come on to Friday. Uh, we have three options here. I know Mark raised concerns about difficulties in Page Hall, but uh, can I see a... Sh Sorry, have we got some conferring here? Or? I, I, I'm really split because of the, the complexity and the challenges facing both Tins Tinsley and Darnell, and I'm getting conflicting suggestions for both Tinsley or Darnell on this one. Um, if I'm looking at Ian, I can't put Ian on the spot on that one. Um, Ask Neil then. Neil, um, out, out of the two, Tinsley and Darnell, which do you think will be best for this approach? I would say Darnell, um, in part because you've got more properties actually included by that trail area. Um, so I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll, be, I'll, I'll get some heckling, but I'll, I'll go down all then. Shall we go with the officer recommendation on that one? <laughs> and spare us a lot of pain. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. <laughs> and thank you all for your help with that. So, that's it, isn't it? What else yes, have I got Chair, to do? for that item, you've, you've answered all the recommendations, both the recommendations and agree, agreed. Okay, thank you to Neil, and I'm sure you'll pass that on to Gillian as well. Um, we can now leave that item. Um, the food waste trial is agreed, and we know what areas it's going to, to be in. So we can now move on to item eight, month one, monitoring financial position and budget timetable. And it's over to you, Ryan. Thank you, Chair. Conscious of the committee's time, so I'll keep this as, uh, as brief as I can. Um, as the report sets out, the Council's in a really challenging financial position, and this report sets out the background to that, talks about the in-year position for the Council and for this committee, and sets out the budget monitoring timetable for next year as well. Um, the Council finished uh, last year, 21-22, about £20 million, £19.8 million overspent. Uh, the position did improve towards the end of the year, but clearly that's not a sustainable position in, in the short or medium term. 
The Council allocated £70 million of reserves to support its, its financial position and to give it time and space to return to a balanced position. Uh, we've now allocated, as the report shows, about £54 million of reserves, 20 relating to the overspend last year, £15 million to balance this year's budget, and, and we're now seeing overspends in the current financial year of just under £19 million. That's at month one. Um, for the committee's benefit, the month two position is very similar to the month one position. It's not moved on much at all. So, what the report also sets out quite clearly is how the Council, over many years in fact, has, has prioritised the investment in adult and children's social care. And that has meant that other services, including many of those covered by this committee, have been uh, cash limited in order to, in order to achieve that prioritisation. And it's, it's worth being you know, clear and upfront with the committee on that. Um, as at month one, as I said, £18.7 million pounds overspent. Uh, the, the significant areas of overspend are within the children's and adults committees, as, as the report uh, highlights. For this committee specifically, a small underspend as at month one of half a million pounds. The month two position is similar, uh, so there's no material change in the budget position from month one to month two. Um, the, the challenges for this committee, though, really are in the risks in the future. Uh, we've talked a lot about food waste this morning. Implementation, implementing the Environment Act uh, is a significant financial risk that this committee will have to address, as are energy costs and inflation relating to uh, both the waste contract and, and the highways contract that, that fall within the remit of this committee. Because of the challenging financial position the Council is in, uh, the Strategy and Resources Committee have approved an earlier budget timetable for 23-24 than we have had in the past. It's about three months earlier in practice. Um, there are no indications that central government are going to give us any more money, uh, and that's the basis on which we're planning, to be, to be quite honest. So that gives us the prospect of a fairly significant budget gap for the whole council when you consider um, the current rate of inflation. Uh, you know, so we, we'd normally expect to see budget gaps of 30, maybe 40 million pounds going from one year to the next in a normal set of circumstances. Uh, given the current rate of inflation, I'm expecting budget gap um, starting with a five. Uh, there'll be a medium term financial analysis report that comes in a couple of weeks to the Strategy and Resources Committee on the 5th of July that will set that out in some detail. That report will also set the budget targets for each of the policy committees. Um, the report will also recommend, as, as the budget timetable sets out, that policy committees come to the September meeting uh, with proposals to balance the budget to the target that strategy and resources will ultimately set. So that requires work um, between the meeting today and the meeting uh, in late September, I think it is for this committee, to work out how to do that. Uh, we will then consolidate the policy committee reports into a single report to strategy and resources on the 12th of October. And that will allow the strategy and resources committee to make any, any, any further decisions on resource allocation, moving between one committee and the next, but hopefully from a position of a balanced budget. The hope is that the process is complete by Christmas. Um, that's necessary to allow the housing committee's report on setting the rent levels to be uh, submitted to the February council meeting full council meeting and uh, the 1st of March meeting of full council will also receive the council tax recommendation and the general from revenue budget covering the work of this committee. Uh, that's all I need to say, Chair. I'm obviously happy to take any questions that members have. Thank you, Ryan, uh, for that, uh, that presentation um, and, and for keeping it succinct. Um, Cliff, I see you have your hand up. Yes, I thank you very much for that. It's very informative. Um, the, the one thing that sort of stands out for me is the cost of the street lighting. Um, I was going to ask you a bit about it, but are you going to bounce that straight back to us and say that's our problem? <laughs> if, if, if your question was, uh, Ryan, can we have some money to pay for the additional cost of street lighting, then I'm afraid that is uh, your, your problem, Councillor. Uh, if it's a different question, then... Uh, ask away. No, no, no I'm, not, I'm not asking for more money, um, um, but the, the, the solution to economising on street lighting, that is, 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 is down to us. You don't have any handle on, on contracts or anything like that. Um, I think uh, if the committee wanted officers to, uh, as part of the work over the summer, develop recommendations 
or options for how the cost of street lighting might be reduced. Um, and you know, I can I can think of options that might involve the, the hours that the, the street lights are lit and so on. That's something you can certainly ask. I don't have a, an answer off the top of my head. We do see uh, pass-through energy costs when it comes to that sort of thing, though, which is why this committee is seeing an overspend. That thing, thank you for that. Can I put that as a proposal, please, Chair? That, 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 that proposal we look into that, a, that, that we do a study on how we can um, uh, re reduce reduce street, street lighting, lighting costs. Yeah. What are the options? Um, Richard, you're okay to bring that back to to us. Mm. Thank you. That'd be for the time for the next committee then. By which time most of the summer will have gone, won't it? Oh, sorry. I'm just wondering, Chair, what, I'm sorry, I'm just wondering, Chair, whether that would be more appropriate to bring it as part of any budget saving proposal collectively rather than a single item. Are members happy with that for it to come through with a with several budget proposals for us to consider? But that's budget saving proposals, I should make clear. Mark, yeah. Thank you. In terms of the proposals going forward and the stuff we will get from Ryan and his team, and I'm mindful that you're already under a lot of stress and pressure as it is. Um, one of the things that I'm really mindful, and all of us councillors will be, is that any changes to service provision that we um, decide upon has impacts on the urban environment in which we all reside. Those impacts directly impact on things like the mental health implications of our residents. So if you're a marginal community, and I'm thinking many within my ward, um, you're already under a lot of stress, certainly with the, house of, uh, the, the cost of living crisis that's going on. If, if you're worried about paying your bills, you open your curtains and you see more fly tipping on the street, that's potentially going to push you over the edge. So though that wouldn't necessarily be reflected in our budgeting costs, there would then be an unintended consequence of passing uh, additional costs onto health services and health service providers. So as part of the impact of any of these suggestions that we have going forward, I'd like for that rounded approach in terms of the unintended consequences to be, to be included in those costings, um, because more than anything, none of us here, for instance, we, we increased the uh, number of hours that the household waste recycling centres were open. A study would be helpful to see whether that did have any impact on, on street littering uh, and, and such like, because if we were to reverse those increases, would that increase in street littering and actually have, has having the more accessible diminished street, street littering? So, so those kind of questions would, would like to be looked at as a round, not just simply as a, as, as a fiscal statement, but as a, a fully a uh, holistic approach, I, I hesitate to use the word holistic because it, it, it's jargon. But yeah, anything that we have to do, would it impact on the well-being of citizens, including mental health elements, or would be really, really helpful. Thank you, Chair. Councillor, if I can perhaps just respond briefly to that. Um, yes. yes e each do. of the budget proposals will need an equality impact assessment, which of course picks up many of the things you've just talked about, but absolutely um, unintended consequences or not indirect consequences, I suppose, are probably a probably more appropriate term, um, should absolutely accompany any budget proposal that comes forward. And that's certainly something we'll work with, uh, with, uh, with the team supporting this committee to do that. That, of course, applies to all committees. It's not just this one. Tim. Yeah, it's just building on from that. Yeah, this 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 all-encompassing approach is, is is pretty good. But one of the things is is because I think the extended opening hours for the, for instance, the uh, household waste sites coincide with COVID, didn't it? And so it's now we're sort of into a sort of post-COVID situation is to see whether by saving on one street we then lose out on another on something else because there's extra costs, and we just then that's something we really can, can sort of monitor from now onwards to see whether that, that would be because we might say we're going to save on one budget line but lose on another another one and so we need to we need to make sure that we get get that right because too often there are cuts in places which then actually cost more um even not even in the medium or long term actually the direct direct impact financially so we need to have that as a, as, a, as an approach 
yeah, I think that's one perhaps for, for me to talk with the, with the officer supporting the committee about, about getting a, a, a piece of work done to assess whether, as Mark said, the, you know, the, uh, the extension of the hours has led to positive benefits and therefore could we infer that redu reducing the hours would see a return to a previous worse situation with cost associated. Paul, do you have a question? Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to say on those couple of things, the, 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 would the council dim the street lights a few years ago and say, William, I'm not sure that there's much, uh, much left in there to reduce that service. And I would say, Mark, regarding extending the opening hours, from my personal anecdotal experience, it absolutely made, had a positive impact. When at the beginning of COVID, when the, the, there was queues of traffic outside the, the tip in my ward, I collected I think it was 28 items of fly tipping within about a quarter of a mile of the, of the waste site. And, um, and of course, opening the tips for longer. There's still fly tipping, but nowhere near as much. And you know that's why we push so hard for it and it definitely works. And also thanks to right, Neil, right, he's been working with us in the ward on fly tipping and it's very much appreciated. I think your point is well made, Paul, and I think it's something that would be echoed around, around the chamber from other members. Um, Barbara, you have a question? Oh, Rick, Richard, sorry, he wants to respond. Thank you, Chair. Just, just picking up on that point, um, the, the current Housing Waste Recycling Centre extended open hours finishes this October, so there will be a full review following that. Um, and then if we want to do that again next year, the sort of timescales are April to October. And we are, and that's for further down on the agenda, we are looking on the forward plan of bringing a full review of Housing Waste Recycling, but also the wider view of the contract as well as part of this. So we'll pick that up as part of that piece of work. But it'll definitely be a review once October is finished this year. I'm mindful of time. Can we uh, bring this uh, this part to a, an end? And uh, I need to ask you um, if you uh, will agree the recommendation, which is on page 11. Is there any dissent to those recommendations? Then that is, that is carried. Thank you very much, Ryan. Right, we now come to item nine, review of private hire and Hackney carriage driver policy. Um, can we begin by receiving um, public questions relating to this item and ask that where possible they be given up answer they be answered in in the responses or a written response will be provided if, if i'm right help chair um i've got two yes there's a zebra and there's an asai roof yeah. i don't know which of you is in the chamber first but <laughs> Sorry, my, my eyes are on Ibra Hussein, <laughs> so I'll take you first. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm going to petition and some questions. So shall I do everything together in one go? Chair? Yes, you can do that in one go. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. My petition, first of all, uh, in relation to the taxi trade is with regards to the MOT test centres. And my petition is specific that we need more approved test centers which are in line with carrying out compliant tests, and tests as well. Now, what, why I am asking for this is that the drivers who are licensed in Sheffield don't particularly have any choice other than one test center that is within council in-house. Now, what's very strange is that uh, drivers licensed in Wolverhampton uh, can have a test in Sheffield and in Rotherham and then come and work with the Sheffield licensed private hire operators. That's very strange because they're picking up Sheffield residents as well. So me as a Sheffield licensed driver, I don't have that facility or that choice. I don't have that choice. Now, 
in my opinion, uh, they need to be approved and they need to be of a certain standard, which others are, and they must be safe. And also, there is no competition there. I pay as a hackney carriage 59 pounds, and a private tire pays, I think, 54 pounds to have a test carried out. And if you are licensed in Wolverhampton, you only pay 40 pounds. So there's already a 20 pound difference, 15 to 20 pound difference either way. And they can work as equally same as me, carry out the passengers in Sheffield as well. So why I and many other of my colleagues within the trade, 2,700 drivers uh, which are licensed in Sheffield cannot have that choice and others can. So I'm asking for a review of that and consideration by the licensing service and bring a report to this committee so it can be looked at in details because in the past there was a tender out a procurement to to be put out but the funny thing is the councils never had that intent to give that out they put so many conditions in a way obstacles that nobody uh, applied so i think it, it's been some time it's important that that is given uh, another fresh look and let's see if that is possible and mindful of others having a choice and we are not as a licensed drivers. So that is that with regards to the petition chair and I'll move on to my general questions and then questions in relation to the item 9 report as well. Question 1, the general questions list and they should be before you as well. Uh, I'll give them in advance. What consideration will the council give to surcharge due to high increase in fuel prices for hackney carriage trade. We've had an increase in early on in the year. However, inflation was 5%, and as you're well aware today, inflation is 9.1% and going up, and the fuel prices went up approximately from 50 to 60p per liter, uh, per liter as well since the last increase as well. So I'm asking for a consideration. Why is the licensing service not open? And when is the licensing service considering this option with timeline and framework? It's been closed due to COVID, but this building is now open. Many other council buildings are open, and trade is asking for that as well. When will the licensing service publish its audited accounts for licensees to examine in depth for licensing service as a whole, including taxi and private tax section? Uh, I think the financial team within the licensing, within the council, always uh, drag his feet. I, I won't really blame the licensing service on this, but I think the, the finan financial team within the councils is always very reluctant to give, for, uh, have a forensic look at the accounts. So we need some answers on that, and this committee has the remit uh, or authorized to do, do so. When the licensing service publishes comprehensive forward plan to bring in IT service and brings licensing service up to date with technology, and portal so drivers can access long overdue service online. This has been a long outstanding issue. Council made in investments in the, last, uh, in the past, bought computers, never used. I think 60 to 70K were wasted, but we need a forward plan. We had discussions with the interim head of the licensing, uh, very uh, productive, I would say, but however, we need results and we need progress. I think that is very important as well. When will licensing service bring to this policy committee a vehicle specification on both hackney carriage and private tyre policy, which was consulted recently? Working with other authorities to stop cross-border working, can the licensing service publish its action to date and future plans including enforcement? Enforcement is non-existent on this. To promote taxi trade in Sheffield, can the licensing service publish its action to date and future plans? Uh, licensing service takes in uh, all the fees, but I've never seen in my 34 years do anything for the trade to publicize the trade and to promote it in a, in a good way. I haven't seen any, and I want to see that. I think it's about time. What step is the licensing service, service taking to assist, support, and give incentives to local residents of Sheffield to take knowledge tests in Sheffield instead? Uh, it's very disheartening to see Sheffield residents taking tests in other cities and then working in Sheffield. I think something needs to be done to look at that to stop cross-border working. We need an out-of-box thinking on that. Can the licensing service publish its taxi trade recognition and engagement policy to date? Can the licensing service publish what support it has given a taxi trade within the last three, three financial years as detailed 19, 
2021-2022. Can the Lasting Service publish its responses and actions to government consultation, example, uh, Department for Transport, etc., affecting the trade policy changes? Within Sheffield City Council, what representation has the Lasting Service made to support the taxi trade and publish its action as evidence in the last three years? I've never seen any evidence to date of what support uh, trade has been given from the licensing service, uh, which is disappointing that we need someone within the council to support us as well, not just take finance. What financial support did the licensing service receive from the government in the last three years, the COVID financial package, and how it was spent, proper breakdown will be appreciated. When is the licensing service uh, proposing to bring forward review of the fees and has previously reported two separate reports, one for general licensing and other for taxi and privatized section. Uh, it's always very welcome to separate the two reports. It's been done in the past because in the, then it gives the real in-depth of where our fees are and how it is done. So that's my general questions, Chair. And then I... I have on the item nine questions as well, which the report officer is going to present. You want to do that as well now quickly? Okay. Yes, please yeah. continue. Okay. So, so for item nine, as before you, what impact the risk assessment carried out for the exist existing driver's license due to change of policy or implementation? I would welcome a detailed explanation on that and how it was done. No indication given what the cost of refresher courses will be for existing driver's license. I couldn't find that in the report. No timeline or framework for implementation of new policy change for existing drivers. I didn't see it. If, if it is, please uh, do highlight. What consideration is given for in-house training, sourcing out or from other organizations outside the council to provide such accredited courses? Will the licensing service publish in writing email to existing drivers explaining in simple uh, English changes agreed by the l policy committee avoiding jargon? Sometimes council's uh, information goes out. It's not in simple English. It, it is a jargon for uh, anyone to understand. Delay period should be allowed due to cost of living crisis for existing drivers only until everything is in place and, and existing drivers are kept updated fully. If this policy is approved today, I'm asking for a delay because if this is not done properly because it's been done in the past, then there are implications for the existing drivers and this needs to be thought through properly. What consideration is given that the policy committee receive a detailed report prior to any implementation and mindful of cost of living crisis that is affecting everyone and special effects on self-employed? Cost of living is uh, really, really bad. It's affecting all of us. Taxi trade is, is on its knees and it's badly affected. So that's why I'm asking for a proper detailed plan and a delay and how that will be implemented. It will be very important. What consideration was given to comments and feedback on knowledge test changes and revising the knowledge test and consideration of deleting routes section only and to stop uh, and, to, and to help support keep Sheffield residents applying for taxi badges and benefit locally to avoid and stop cross-border working in Sheffield. Bring the report to this policy committee on knowledge tests. These are my questions, Chair. And I, I, you have a copy of that. Here. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Ibrahim. Are people happy for all the questions to be read out and then to get an officer response and officers can decide whether they want to respond directly to the questions or whether they believe some of them may come up in the course of the presentation. Is that okay? Yeah. So NASA, do you want to bring your questions? Can you put the speaker on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so first of all, good morning, respected councillors, council officers, um, and to public members and people that have come from the trade uh, here today to watch. Um, as we come to a very difficult situation 
that the taxi trade is going through at this moment in time. And can I first of all start off by saying what confusion we as a trade are experiencing at this moment in time. We've got three different committees where licensing is now being discussed. So we're here today as part of a waste management type committee and regulatory committee to talk about badge conditions and driver issues and driver things. We've had a last meeting last week with regards to clean air zones and the impact that's going to have on taxi drivers. And then we've also got the licensing two committees, a licensing committee and a subcommittee. So we're having three or four different boards to deal with. So the work of a representative and a volunteer within the tax trade, because we're unpaid volunteers within the tax trade, me and my colleagues here today, that have taken away from their own businesses and their own things to be here. And the amount of time we're having to put in is absolutely phenomenal in this past week, week and a half. So we'd ask for some sort of clarity from the council with regards to, is this going to be the long-term now process where we're going to have to prepare for three different subcommittees, knowing we're volunteers and we're doing it for free to help our trade and also to help the public of Sheffield safeguard and keep them safe? Um, or, and, and can we get some clarity with regards to that? Now coming to the, uh, the main item that I have where the comments, the questions are. Um, first of all, Something's been brought up by another trade, uh, by, by another individual um, on his own accord with regards to a petition. Now, that petition wasn't presented as a formal petition on the council's website. However, it's been presented today. Uh, I'm here to speak against that petition as well. The reason for that is basically on the basis of safeguarding members of the public. Now, as you well know, COVID-19 has had a, an, a devastating impact on the taxi trade. We saw many of our taxi drivers pass away with COVID while transporting hospital patients, transporting laptops to vulnerable children. You know, they've done absolutely phenomenal work, these heroes that are out there, that I'm very, very lucky at, and in the pleasure of having to know and work with some other companies out there, like helping school children with laptops when there was a shortage, getting them learning from home, whether it was distributing food via various packages they've done, you know, they're distributing medicines. They're absolute heroes out there on the road that we're now talking about in this way. The impact that's on their livelihood for two years, basically drivers were taking on pittance, not even enough to cover the bills. They were getting handouts from the local government to, to get support. Taxi licensing will tell you that. The officers will tell you the, the, real, the, the reality on the ground out there within the community. It's a terrible situation. Company owners here today will tell you what the devastating impact it was on them and also on their companies as well. The situation that we're in is because of this national shortage that we have of taxi drivers in every town and city that they're facing. In Sheffield, you have that. But you have a cross-border working where drivers can work from other licensing authorities in this area. Now, while our union position is that we would like local drivers, we wouldn't like cross-bordering, we've got to face the reality. That's a national piece of legislation which authorities, although they can influence a lobby, they can't actually do anything about it legally. So therefore, because it's there and it's a, it's a national legislation, we've got to work with the system. So we would like to work with the system and say, if there are people working, you don't restrict them by closing lanes off and having it only to Sheffield drivers, which has been proposed in proposals and petitions. We need to work with these drivers and you need to work with the people of Sheffield. There's no point somebody booking a taxi from Sheffield to Rotherham, paying £15 with one particular driver, and then one particular driver has to go all the way around the bus lanes and restrict him as an authority if you listen to what the petitioner is asking for. And, that, and then that person paying 25 or £30. It, it, it's, it's ludicrous. This idea will not work. So I'm here strongly to, on behalf of operators and on behalf of those taxi drivers out there that are trying to make ends meet at the minute, is to, to put an end to that and, and not let that petition go any further. In regards to the consultation the council's done, there's some fantastic ideas in this policy. There's things that we're really supportive of, like refresher trainings, but there is also like a, a massive downside to this, which needs to still be discussed and ironed out. So this 400-page report that you'll find in front of you, uh, basically, it's been in front of our eyes now a couple of weeks with regards to this meeting and, and being in front of us. There have been contacts that we have spoken about and we've done, but the consultation had 178 or so responses, less than 200 responses from a trade that has over 3,000 taxi drivers out there on the road approximately. To have 178 drivers, that should worry you as councillors today when you're making a decision on something where there's been so little impact, so little input from the taxi trade out there. With regards to operators, with regards to various others, the communication just simply hasn't been there. 
And I know there's a, not trying to blame the entire licensing authority by saying they're not doing the job properly, but there are other factors, such as the COVID-19 impact out there. Drivers have not had communications with regards to emails and various other things. So I'm asking you here today to defer this decision today with regards to putting through this policy. And the reason for that is because of the possible cost, not possible, the definite cost impact to drivers that we are still yet to clarify. We're also asking the authority here today to work with us, put back on the trade meetings which we had prior to COVID. And throughout COVID, there have been drop-in sessions and things where we've spoken to them, but we need as a trade and trade reps, along with operators, to sit down across the table and come up with realistic ways of how we can also support the trade as well. There's many things in there that will impact on drivers, as I've said in my email to the council as well. So where we find ourselves now is in the position where the indecision here today that is to be taken by yourselves needs to reflect the view of the drivers out there on the road. You need to work with us. And what I would request to yourselves here today is to defer the entire licensing, that, 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 this report, and send it back to officers so the officers can come back to the ta taxi trade out there. And the representatives are all unanimous there in majority of us are in agreement that we will want to work with the officers and we want to address the finer details of that report. Once you've made a decision, there's no point then afterwards sitting down because we wouldn't be able to undo any decision. However, if you would delay it to your next meeting, we would be able to have that discussion and we would be able to come back as a unified trade to also send a picture out there with the general public that safeguarding the public remains our number one priority as taxi drivers and as a union as well. Um, and I'll just see if I've got anything else to comment on. But I do want to kind of, unfortunately, give you the consequences of if you take a decision to vote uh, uh, with and, and, and agree with the officer's recommendation and push this policy through. You'll create a divided trade out there. A council that doesn't listen to its drivers, that's another image that will go out there. Many drivers didn't receive the communication and the correspondence with regards to the consultation. There are a quality impact assessment that's done in there and it affects BAME people within there. So it almost will come across, or the perception will be strong out there, that it discriminates against our minority communities. A trade where more drivers will leave the trade. You've already heard from other, another individual here today that there are people that are going and getting licenses from other authorities to go around the rules and go around the, the regulations, which is currently allowed under cross-bordering. Although you can't do anything about that, you're going to have more drivers moving away. And we've seen that in Rotherham, where this policy has been implemented. It's one of the most draconian policies. And for 15 years, as a representative, working in the taxi field and working as a taxi driver in Rotherham, telling you outright it's a draconian, a very discriminatory policy. And that's why it was in the Rotherham Advertiser last week, for those of you that want to make reference to that. So what we're expecting is uh, or our wishes to this committee and councillors here today is to adjourn this matter, defer it, whatever fancy word you want to use, but put it back through to officers. Let's have that discussion collectively as a community and let's come back with some sort of unity and let's deal with the issue head on. Thank you so much for your time uh, and I hope you guys make the right decision today. Thank you. Thank you, Nasa. Um, yeah, Alice is going to read out some questions from people who've not, who are not... Um, able to come to the meeting today um, yes um, there was so I'll just read the questions out um, one Sheffield licensed driver asked what steps is the council taking in card machines as a licensing condition for all hackney carriage vehicles as a station driver I see customers being refused for this sole reason this should be a vehicle license condition immediately in my opinion Second question, the knowledge tests need to be separate for hackney carriage drivers and a separate one for private hire new applicants. Um, another question from a, a, another taxi driver is, I would like to ask the board why are drivers being subjected to a policy where they are being discriminated against where Sheffield City Council are trying to implement the double standard policy of being convicted of an offence of using a mobile fine, phone device and having their taxi license suspended and not being able to apply again for a number of years. There was then a question submitted from um, James Martin 
on behalf of Transport for All Taxi subgroup. Um, I will say with all these questions, members of the committee, you should have had a sight of them. Um, I'll summarise what James Martin says, but he is, he's keen to point out the taxi and private hire driver policy update is really important for the disabled people of, of the city. We've regularly heard from people over many years about issues, many of which relate to driver understanding and or lack of response to needs. For the group of disabled people who have input into consultation responses, this is too slow. Safeguarding and disability and equality training are closely coupled topics. We hope that the period, and the ask is, we hope that the period to adopt disability and equality training is reduced back to the original period identified in the consultation and that a response will be given to concerns around hackney drivers and exemption certificates. And they draw attention to the need, the background for quicker training requirements to be reinstated in alignment with the wider transport sector and that the time is now to redress that. They also talk about wheelchair assistance exemptions and that um, we need a policy that very clearly um, minimises or, or, or makes it very appropriate why there are those exemption certificates. And if it's not possible to resolve that, they ask that a formal written response is given by licensing officers as appropriate, indicating the precise reasons that other transport industry rules are not replicated. Thank you, Alice. Um, Richard, do any officers want to respond to any of those? Yeah. So is that? that Thank you, you Chair. Claire. Um, Thanks. I think probably the best way to do it today, in terms of timing, um, is to respond to those question askers, if they don't mind, mm -hmm. that we do so in, in writing within seven days. So, uh, Ibra, your uh, petition question and email one, uh, the general questions, if I could get back to you within seven days on those, is that okay with you? Yes. Okay. Um, email two, the driver specific, the driver policy specific questions, Craig, can you pick those up? Yes, certainly, yeah. so I've got a list of those questions on my computer, if I can go through them in the order that I've got, if that's okay with you. So in regards to the, uh, the disability questions that were just uh, read out by Alice. So in regards to the period for completing uh, disability training, um, we looked at the comments received during the consultation and um, the process we need to undertake to source accredited providers and felt like a three year time period would be more reasonable um, three-year time period is the longest a licensee could be licensed for. Um, the safeguarding aspect is a separate to the disability training. Many drivers have already undertaken that for part of the initial training and we're also looking at other accredited providers to do that and there may be an option for free training in-house for licensees so there will be no cost impact on them. Um, just to make you aware we're still looking into that so that is, that is not a promise but something we're looking into. And in regards to exemption certificates for hackney drivers, um, this is not something we've imposed at a local, um, at a local level. Um, it's something that's contained in the Equality Act 2010, where if licensees have got um, some, I'll, I'll read the wording to you because it'll be better. So an exemption to assist passengers um, on the basis of medical grounds or the grounds that the person is, the physical condition makes it impossible. Um, they can apply for an exemption for that. So that's something that's included in a, a national policy, not, not something locally. And then to move on quickly. So the questions that was asked in regards to um, the convictions of mobile phones and then the authority taking further action on that. Again, that's not something we've imposed locally, but something that was uh, imposed in the statutory standards that came out in July 2020. Um, that any driver caught using a phone or other motoring offences would have a rehabilitation period before they could reapply for licence. What we've done during the consultation period, we've, we've read the responses from the trade and licensees and we've removed that. So what we're now doing is a referral to our subcommittee who will hear individual cases and make a decision on that basis. So that blanket policy has now been removed. 
the licensing subcommittee, though, will use the DFT standards as a basis for making a decision. And then to move forward, in regards to the, um, the anonymous question, so in regards to card machines, that's something that isn't related to the driver policy but the vehicle policies, which will be brought before committee later in the year. And then in regards to the knowledge test, all licensees in Sheffield are granted a dual license, which allows them to drive both a hackney or private hire, and they can swap on a daily basis if they wish. We therefore think we should keep the, the one test for all licensees, and the standards are the same across the hackney carriage and the private hire sector in, in that regard. And just to follow up um, on some of Ibra's questions, so I'll be as quick as I can. So we've undertaken quality impact assessment in regards to this um, report, and that is contained in the report as an appendix. Um, in regards to refresher courses for existing licensees, as I touched upon a while ago, we're still looking at accredited providers to undertake those courses for us, um, and we'll look to provide free safeguarding training where that is a possibility. Um, in regards to implementation for existing drivers, so we've recommended in the report an implementation date the 1st of September. That will allow us to write out to all existing licensees with the proposals, and then any time periods will be implemented from that date. So a 12-month time period for undertaking the course will be from the 1st of September. Um, if we're asked about in-house trading, we're looking at all options um, that are available to us. Will we publish um, in plain, simple English the committee of avoiding jargons on certain things? Yes, of course we'll do that. Um, I'm just moving forward. There's a question about the, the knowledge test. So uh, we've recently reduced the pass rate from 100 to 80% for the knowledge test. That is allowing more local drivers to pass and hopefully get licensed with Sheffield moving forward. Um, and then the last question that it brought um, posed was a policy a policy becoming before you on the knowledge test the knowledge test is included in this driver policy which will be considered today and I can provide um, written answers to those as well if necessary thank you Craig and sorry Claire you want to come back in yeah sorry I'd just like to to cover some of NASA's questions please um, NASA was particularly concerned about the consultation that was carried out. Um, you, you're right, NASA, we, we did only receive less than 100 comments, but the consultation document was sent to, to all our licensed drivers um, via a piece of software that we use called Gov Delivery, so it was sent in a bulletin to keep it as simple as possible, so the message was delivered to them quite succinct and they understood what was happening in it, and then there was a link to click through. So we sent that to two and a half thousand drivers and where we didn't have those email addresses they were sent a hard copy in, uh, via letter. Um, the software gives us kind of reports out of that um, and it told us that 69% of the emails were opened um, by the drivers. Um, so we feel that they did have a really good coverage, drivers did receive it. Um, and then just moving on to one of the reasons that NASA wanted to defer is that he wanted to, to look at putting back the trade meetings in. Well, that's something that we've already done. Um, we held a meeting with trade union reps on the 23rd of February this year and also on the 4th of May this year. So we've already held two quarterly meetings with the trade union reps. Unfortunately, they weren't very well attended. Um, invitations were sent out. Um, representatives from GMB did attend. Um, unfortunately, NASA didn't, um, but his colleagues did. Um, so we feel that the consultation was carried out appropriately, um, but obviously that, that, that's up to you to make a decision today. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Right, so we've had, we've had questions. I, I, with time moving on, I think we're going to, I'm going to ask officers to, to give us a summary of the, the key points from this report. I mean, it's a 329 page document. Uh, <coughs> as bed, bedtime reading goes, I've had, I've had better. 
<laughs> but uh, that's, that's no, uh, that's not to um, to uh, comment adversely on your, on the, the hard work that went into putting all the information and legislation together to, to make up that that report. So, is that over to you, Richard, or you? to you, Craig? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just before I go on to the report, can I just say that I do understand the hardship that licensees are going through at the moment in regards to the cost of living crisis. Um, I'm, we've tried to be proportionate in regards to this, um, this report and policy. So I'll be as brief as I can. So we're, we're seeking approval of the revised policy. So we first published this, this, this policy in 2016, and it's been revised due, due to changes since that time. So we're hoping the policy provides um, applicants, decision makers and enforcement with guidance um, moving forwards. And in providing this policy, it allows transparency, accountability, and consistency across the licensing regime, regime in Sheffield. Um, we're, we're hoping that the committee approves the revived policy with an implementation of the 1st of September. Um, just in regards to the proposal, so the licensing authority is responsible for the regulation of drivers in the district of Sheffield. Um, and there's two primary pieces of legislation that govern that. Um, however, in July 2020, the Department for Transport issued statutory taxi and private high standards. The overarching aim of those standards was um, the protection of children and vulnerable adults who are over the age of 18 from any harm. Um, it's a requirement of those standards for authorities to in implement them, unless there's compelling reasons not to do so. Um, and it's also important, it also states within that that we should um, publish a policy on our standards. Um, so, therefore, it's important that we comply as an authority in regards to those standards that are nearly two years um, out of date. Um, we've, as I've said, we've already got in place a public policy, um, um, but this policy updates from what we first had in 2016. So, we've reviewed the policy in line with the statutory standards. Um, so, the policy is designed to provide individuals with a clear, consistent basis for submitting applications provide a clear, consistent basis for determining license applications, and provide licensees with information on licensing requirements throughout the time at which they are licensed. The primary focus of this policy is protection of the public, um, but in particular safeguarding children and protecting the vulnerable. Um, and users of transport, specifically taxes and private hire, should be assured that licensees are appro appropriately trained and vetted and held to account for their performance. Um, this policy aims to achieve just that. So, moving forward, so I hope the policy is designed to provide individuals with a clear, consistent basis um, for all those who need to use it, a consistent basis for determining applications, um, achieve compliance with legislation and those statutory standards that I've just um, informed of, and then support wider strategies and initiatives uh, specific to driver licensing, including safeguarding. Um, in regards to the consultation, just quickly, we carried out a formal 10-week consultation as Nasser's uh, alluded to, we received 171 responses, 136 were from Sheffield licensees. Um, and just to go over the most common themes that the consultation brought about, I'll be as quick as I can on this. So in regards to the certificate, so the first stage of applying for a license, I think there was some confusion in how that was written, so I've amended that. That is now just a requirement for new applicants or those applicants who have not been licensed for a 12-month period um, unless they have taken it previously. In regards to safeguard training, um, we're looking for all licensees to complete that within 12 months. Individuals who have taken the certificate will be exempt because it, it falls within that training. Um, consultation responses did ask for three years, but we, we feel that 12 months is sufficient um, and will hopefully offer that in-house as well. Disability awareness training, um, we proposed um, 12 months. We listened to the response of the licensees and increased it to three years. Um, it's something we've never done in Sheffield before, but we, we realised disability training, uh, awareness training is really important. Um, so we've gone for three years. We need to find accredited providers for that. There was a large part on language proficiency. Um, we've listened to the consultation results again, and we've made it a requirement for new applicants only, and that can be evidenced by the certificate um, which they undertake at college. Uh, we've removed that requirement for current licensees. The knowledge test, we've reduced the pass mark from 100 to 80% in order to hopefully get more people licensed within Sheffield. DBS checks, uh, we've asked all drivers to sign up online. 
Um, there's a cost benefit to that of £13 a year. Um, we're now duty bound to undertake six monthly checks. Other applications can range £40 and upwards. Um, overseas convictions, that's a requirement of the statutory standards, so we've, we've, we've kept that in. Um, and some other ones, um, I think a licensee wanted some clarification on the dishonesty in regards to the fit and proper requirement. That's something that's contained in primary legislation and we'll use that basis for this dishonesty part. Motoring convictions, so as has been mentioned in some of the um, speeches there, we, we were looking at imposing rehabilitation periods on those. Um, so, for example, if you're found using a mobile phone, you'll have to wait five years before you can reapply. We've removed all those rehabilitation periods from motoring convictions and instead we, we've, we're going to do what we do currently, which is refer to the licensing subcommittee to make a decision, using the, the statutory standards as the basis for making the decision on that. Applying for hire, we, we kind of consulted on rehabilitation periods of seven years. We've removed that and um, recommended a 12-month probation, 12-month period on that. And then the last one really is working for multiple operators. So we understand that we've got licensees that work for various operators in and around Sheffield, for example, Uber, City Taxis and Bolt. We've got no issues with that. So we, we, we think you could have a driver working for City Taxis during the day and then Uber during the evening. But what we don't want is, what we wouldn't want to see is drivers working for multiple platforms all at once and then cherry picking the, the most lucrative jobs on that. So that's why that requirement is in the conditions on that. And just to finish off quickly, um, rec reasons for the recommendation. So the Department for Transport recommends that all licensing authorities make publicly available a policy document and to review the document every five years. Um, we have in place a document, this is the revised document, puts those standards into practice and it's recommended that members approve the policy in order for the updated recommendations to be implemented as soon as possible. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, uh, that concise report, Greg. Do members have any questions? Right, so I've seen Mark, then Barbara, then Alexi, so Mark, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a really complex area that, that we're looking to address, and in our first meeting, it, it, it's in at the deep end for sure. My, my primary concerns around, around much of this element here is um, I'm not familiar enough with a lot of the licensing rules to know what is absolutely mandatory and that we don't have any... Um, ability to change and what isn't so though the report is quite a substantive one <laughs> I may be asking for it to be even bigger where where it's actually hived off into two elements of one element which is the stuff we must absolutely do and when we have to absolutely do it like if we're not in abeyance of any particular national guidance now um, what do we need to do to get get that abeyance done and the bits where we uh, do have more discretion on um, some of the more local elements of that, how we can actually then influence those decisions. Because I'm really mindful that we aren't necessarily the uh, authority on, on, on much of this. Um, certainly some of the elements around um, the disability access to taxes and how this, how this report works, uh, both for drivers and users, I'm unsure of. I, 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 I was really concerned about the number of respondents, uh, as the petitioners asked, uh, highlighted here. The fact that two thirds of the those receiving the uh, material electronically opened it um, does kind of answer some of the questions. Are kind of like, well, how 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 many people knew about this? Well, apparently a lot. However, the sheer fact that they didn't respond also flags concerns to me because we don't know whether they're content with what's being proposed or bamboozled by what's being proposed or, or just simply switched off uh, because they're feeling like it's being imposed uh, as opposed to proposed. Um, so, so some of those elements do concern me. The, the, 
who can get into a taxi, for instance, with a big disabled chair and understanding which taxis are fit for them and understanding which drivers are fit to take those big chairs is something I have a particular concern with because it's not just about accessibility for, for our, 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 our citizens who can't get around the city, but it's also about maintaining the safety of drivers who are dealing with potentially dangerous equipment. Um, I, I, I can't understand how all these elements blend into here. Uh, and I have to have to say that, that, that that's down to my ignorance, uh, and, and, and I obviously need a lot more assistance and help in understanding those implications. The bits about the CCTV, in my head, it feels like the CCTV elements and the uh, audio elements of um, of the relationships that go on with drivers and passengers within the cab are, are important uh, because uh, it can certainly mitigate any false allegations against drivers, but it can also preserve the, the safety of, of the passengers of it. How, how this can... We, we talk about it in this policy, but we don't necessarily say about how we're going to go forward with it and how we're going to implement it or, or, or what sanctions there would be from that, many of those elements. So, again, I, I'm not entirely sure whether this report adds or detracts from, from that safeguarding part. Um, so, so I, I'm kind of really, really struggling on, on, on some of these elements. So I, I, I guess if, if I was to have a question and not just a statement, Chair, it would be which parts of this do we have discretion on and which parts of this don't we have discretion on? Um, and is it possible for us, before we make the decision, to have further uh, training and advice on, on many of these elements. And I know I'm only giving you these, these, these questions today and I, I've not had a chance to do that earlier, but it, it, to, to a certain extent that's due to the complexity of, of this. Uh, as as Councillor Woodcraft mentioned earlier, he's sat on licensing for a while. He's, he's probably better suited than most of us for making decisions on this policy today. I, I, I'm not sure I, I, I'm, I'm equipped for that. If, if I'm being honest, Chair. So, so actually, would it, would it be possible to get officer feedback on what we, what we do have discretion and don't have discretion on? And, and, and actually, does making a decision to, today negate any of that relevance for, for, for what we do going forward? Because I don't want to see us um, taken to the Ombudsman because we've not got a policy, but by the same token, I don't want to make, see us make decisions that have unintended consequences to the detriment of both drivers and users within Sheffield and, and that environment in which we're, we're trying to push things to a better position. Um, thank you, thank you, uh, and thank you, Chair. Yes, do you want to respond to that, Craig? Yeah, I'll provide an explanation. I might have to bring my colleague Clive in to provide some further help. Um, just to touch on some of the things that um, Councillor Jones said in regards to the CCTV element, that's not something that's part of this particular policy, but that forms part of the vehicle policies which we've recently consulted on. Um, and then in regards to the mandatory, non-mandatory type of requirements within the policy, um, th this policy kind of builds on what we had in 2016. Um, so in regards to the safeguarding training, that's now mandatory. Probably the, the, the one piece of information, one piece of guide, sorry, the one piece of policy that isn't mandatory but we're hoping to impose is the disability awareness training, which we think is really important for disabled people in Sheffield. So whilst it's not mandatory, we think it's something we should impose locally and what a lot of other local authorities are now carrying out um, nationwide. Um, kind of to give you a brief example of what this policy is about, we, we want to ensure that all our licensees are fit and proper. Um, that's what it states in the legislation. However, there is no definition of what fit and proper is. Therefore, we have discretion as local authority to impose tests and checks. Therefore, we ask all our drivers to go to college to complete a specific course. That was started in Sheffield and is now going nationwide. We do the knowledge test, the driving assessments, the medical assessments. Um, these are all kind of, um, they're not mandatory. The EVS checks, that's, that's now something in statutory guidance, which we've always done. Um, but we're now building on what statutory guidance says. That's um, more checks, so it's six monthly checks. Um, we, we can carry those out online for the people that have signed up online. Um, so there are many discretionary checks, a lot that have been in place for a number of years. So the ones we're now including are the safeguarding training for current licensees and the disability awareness training is something that's new as well. And then we've looked at some of the, the referrals to commit subcommittee on regards to motoring convictions and criminal, criminal convictions. 
So the criminal conviction ones are born out of the statutory guidance, so we, we, have to, we have to bear those in mind. The motoring convictions, we listen to what the licensees and trade said. We re remove those periods, but we'll refer to committee to make a decision with all the evidence before them. Um, I don't know if my colleague Clark can, can build on what I've said. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, to try and answer briefly, uh, Councillor, um, the legislation dates back hundreds of years, to be honest, on, on some of it. 1976 is the latest legislation we use. Uh, the DFT have imposed statutory guidance, and, and we need to use the word guidance uh, in, in reality. It guides licensing authorities on what they expect a, or from a driver or a proprietor or a, or a licensee. Uh, and what we've done with these, with this policy is align the policies to the guidance. That is not to say we then deal with drivers on an individual basis, we do. Uh, that is different around the country, uh, and I'm not sure colleagues from the GMB and, and representatives from the trade will, will back that up. It's completely different in every authority. Basically, you adopted the, uh, the licensing legislation in 1976 as an authority, and then you did what you like within that legislation. Uh, and that's why you see multiple layers of different aspects of licensing around the country and you're getting a different type of vehicle. That's a hackney in Nottingham, that it is in Sheffield. Um, so we've tried in this policy to align that to the guidance. Uh, the fallback position is the licensing subcommittee, if it remains that way, deals with a driver as an individual or an operator or a licensee of a vehicle on a case-by-case -case basis, but they must have uh, due uh, respect to the guidance. They can go against that guidance and the base of the DFT have turned it on its head. They've said, if you go against the guidance, you need to give reasons why you've gone against the guidance in the minutes to the driver and to the public. If you don't, if you stay with the guidance, the guidance is the guidance and you've stayed with the guidance. So on refusals or revocations of licenses, they would use the guidance and say, we believe you've not uh, put your case forward today and we're not either the licensing or we're revoking your license for these reasons. And now they have to put reasons in if they also keep his license, like the mitigating circumstances, long history of good driving, and colleagues will tell you from the trades that we've had a number of licensees already under the guidance, been in front of committee, and they've not suffered what the guidance has said, which is a five year, don't come back for five years, etc. cetera. Uh, they've had other, um, I wouldn't call it, um, determinations done against them, uh, and they're still driving most of them, etc., with mobile phone issues and, and, and driving issues. So, in a nutshell, we're trying to align in there. So, statutory guidance is what we have to do, and we have to take note of it, and then the rest of it, as, as Clay, uh, Craig's pointed out, is what we can do and manipulate as a local authority for our citizens and our drivers within this authority. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Clive, um, I'm conscious that time is, is moving on. I'm going to impose a guillotine at 12.30, that we take a decision there. Uh, so in the meantime, I've got Barbara next. Thank you, Chair. Um, right, I'll try to be brief. What would be the consequences of deferring the policy to, say, the September meeting? Um, also, you say a policy will be in place for five years before being reviewed. So what opportunities would there be to review the policy as you go along? Um, a lot of the responses to the consultation referred to statutory standards and therefore you couldn't change them. But we want the licensees in Sheffield to operate to Sheffield standards so they support. And uh, so you address some of the concerns, and I noticed that, sort of how you amended it. But I couldn't see, I mean, it does bother me, the cross-border trade. And if we want our taxi drivers to comply with our regulations, what can we do to protect them from this in, in the guidance? Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Um, are you, are you Thank you, I'll, I'll try and answer the cross-border part first and the consequences. Um, Literally, since the Act came into power in 1976, the ability to, for drivers to operate outside of their area and pick up, pick up passengers has been in the, in the Act. Um, it wasn't used regularly because of the old systems we had in those days where you used to ring up a local firm uh, and somebody used to pin a job to a nail and the driver was sent to pick you up. Um, as we know, since 1976, times have moved on, technology's moved on, 
and the likes of app-based systems have arrived uh, and drivers have moved with the times. Um, it's been tested in national courts and, and stated cases that a driver operating for a Wolverhampton, say, operator with a Wolverhampton vehicle and Wolverhampton licence can pick up in Sheffield. There's no legal problems with that at all. It's called the three licence rule. Uh, and therefore, as officers, we're very, very limited in our, in our ability to enforce or even try and, for want of a better word, rid the city of those out-of-town drivers. Um, there are obviously ways that uh, people do it, and there's, there's other means and, and, and things of doing that. But uh, would we want to reduce standards in Sheffield to and, and allow those drivers to, to, to uh, work where they live? because a lot of the drivers are living in Sheffield, uh, and that is a committee decision. Uh, our standards are set as they've been set for a while, our testing regimes are set as, as they've been a while, and, and we have those standards, and we have a lot of drivers that have gone through a lot to gain a, a driver's license in Sheffield, uh, and do a lot of homework and a lot of work to gain that license, uh, but it is open to this committee, or, or to whoever, whichever committee, what those standards they want here. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the cross-border hiring is a problem nationally uh, that may have to be addressed by national legislation if it was to change. Um, we do work with operators, and uh, we have worked with one of the major operators on apps to ring-fence their drivers out of the city uh, so they can geo-fence the jobs, uh, but they will only do it for Yorkshire, which is a massive area, as everybody knows. Um, they won't do it anymore at the moment. We will keep working on that, but that is just one major operator. Uh, and what you find in the trade is once they learn the loopholes across the country, the trade follows. Uh, and we've now got this influx where it's, where it's a major problem, whereas 20 years ago it was unheard of. Thank you, Clive. Um, I've got Alexi next. Sorry, Chair, do you want to come in on the other points that the Council raised as well in regards to not adopting the, the policy? <laughs> I, th I think we need to move on. I'm going to to let Alexi, Alexi come in. Right, I'd like to know what the consequences are if we don't adopt it today. I think it actually matters to the decision. Okay, it's a fair question. Uh, thank you, Chair. So, the statutory guidance came out in July 2020 during the first wave of the pandemic. Um, we, we adopted some of it where we could, um, and drivers have been in front of the committee for that. But, but what the guidance says, the statutory standards say, sorry, is that local authorities must adopt a policy and to review it every five years. We can take interim reviews within that period if things change or we want to change certain parts of the policy. So in, in regards to deferring it, um, we may be negating the requirements of the, something that's um, the DFT national guidance. Um, we're two years um, down the road since it came out. We don't want to defer it any longer. We are imposing certain parts of it, but the policy brings together all those requirements and provides licensees and decision makers within the licensing committee to make a legal decision on a, on a licensee's kind of future within, within the licensed trade. From what you've said, do I understand that you, even if a decision wasn't made today, you would have to impose those parts that the government requires you to? Yes, so we do impose certain parts of the statutory standards but what this policy kind of points out is what we'll do at a local level in regards to them certain standards, so how we carry out certain checks and balances. Thank you. Alexi, do you want to speak? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, first of all, I'd just like to, um, again, recognise the great sacrifice and service of taxi drivers during the pandemic. Um, you really kept Sheffield going and actually saved a lot of lives and prevented a lot of problems in terms of mental health and everything, so I really appreciate that. Um, and thank you as well for the report, Craig, on it. It's really um, comprehensive. Thanks, do you have a question? Yeah, I do, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> like to say, I think actually Barbara did ask the questions that I wanted to ask, but one was just on the disability, um, two on the, the uh, disability question. Um, could the, the time be changed uh, to make it more ambitious? Um, I know you said three years, but could it say, with the, we want to do it within 12 months, but we'll have a bit of leniency on that because it is a new thing, but an ambition to do it as soon as possible, because I think it is really important for, to say to people that that training does come in as soon as possible. And is there any leeway in the exemption of um, <clears throat> the Hackney 
uh, carried this exemption for uh, being able to take wheelchair users because, in, as James pointed out, um, in other trades, like you couldn't be a train driver if you couldn't do that role and why isn't that different? Uh, I understand the need for temporary exemptions if you've got an injury, but you know, I think we've got, we have a commitment to 100% hackney carriages being wheelchair accessible. I think that should remain. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. So in regards to the uh, time frame for disability training, uh, that could be a decision that members make today to in, in, introduce a time limit. So we propose three years. You have um, the ability to reduce that to two years or 12 months as we initially consulted on. And in regards to the exemption certificates, so that's um, under the Equality Act, um, as I stated earlier, but, but we could look at making a requirement that those who have got an exemption are referred to our subcommittee and the subcommittee make a decision on um, just giving them a license to drive a private hire vehicle, for example, or drive a vehicle where they're not loading and unloading wheelchairs. That's something we'd have to discuss at a service level to see if that's um, possible. Um, just, just for information, and I haven't got any facts or figures or reporting tools on this, but I don't think we've got any drivers with an exemption within Sheffield, and this has been in force since about 2017, I think. Um, no drivers have got an exemption. Cliff, you'd have to be very quick. <laughs> I'm not sure you'll get an answer, though. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'd just like to make a point. Echo, echo, echo um, uh, Councillor Jones, this is a huge topic. You know, very difficult to deal with. Um, and I'm possibly the only person here who's actually sat on a licensing committee. Perhaps there are others. I apologise if, if you haven't. Um, very difficult thing to, to deal with. Um, I'm very cognizant of the, of the pressures that the trade are under at this particular time, um, and to impose these other requirements on them, I'm deeply concerned about that, although I think the, disab the, 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 protection, the disability training is really, really important, and I agree with, with Alexis' proposal of, of making it a two-year um, requirement. Um, I would like to see, if, if we are going to do this, um, a revision of, of, of the Hackney charges um, very, very soon. Um, I don't know how soon we can do that, but you know, we're, 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 in, you know, we're piling more stuff onto the trade. who are really, really struggling. It's been very well explained, so I, I think we need to do that. Thank you, Cliff, and I, I want to echo that concern that uh, nearly all of us here um, have not had experience of, of licensing committee. Um, we've had no training in licensing. We've had quite a lot on process, um, so we should be pretty good at uh, running the committee system now, although with the deadline fast approaching, you probably wouldn't know that was the case. Um, but I, I've, I've really got grave concerns about, about ta taking this through today, particularly when it, it really should go to licensing committee, I feel, to get the views of, of people who actually have to make these policies work on, um, in, the, in the licensing committee. And I'd be then much happier for it to come back at, a, at the next full meeting of, of this committee. But we will have to take a vote on it. So I'm going to ask if any member wishes to dissent. Well, no, I'm going to phrase it the other way. Um, recommendation on page 46. That members of the committee approve the revised Hackney Carriage and Private Hire Drivers Licence Policy to come into force on the 1st of September. I will be voting against that. Um, and I would want to put, if, if that, if, if that, so if the recommendation is not carried, I would put in a counter recommendation. Can I ask if that, if we go with the recommendation, is that with the two year for the, um, uh, for the disability um, checks plus, plus an early review of taxi licensing? Fees. Would, uh, these, uh, would that be including the recommendation? Are they, because are they duly seconded? 
Chair, that would have to be a proposal from the floor to amend the recommendation, because the recommendation is to adopt the policy as attached to the report. So if that would need a, a proposal of an amendment, and we'd have to vote on that. Mark. Could I ask if, if we were to ask that we got the steer from a licensing committee, how, how long would that take? How quickly could that be achieved? As Madam Chair, I think if we're going to do that, we'll have to bring it back to the next September committee and we'd have another session with the licensing committee if that was this committee's recommendations so that they could have an opportunity to uh, consult on this, on this policy and then bring back some recommendations. Chair, you, you could seek a proposal. If that's the view of the committee, you could seek somebody could put forward a proposal of an amendment to suggest that you seek the views of licensing committee before taking a decision. Yes, we, we're happy to put that as a proposal. Um, then could I propose that we seek the views of the licensing committee before we uh, implement or, or authorise this, this policy, if at all possible? Do I have a seconder for that? Thank you, Nabila. I would also ask that we have some. Yeah. 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 Okay, all those in favour of the amendment? Can I see a show of hands? Okay. Those against? Those abstaining? Thank you. And that amendment is passed. I would also ask that there's some training put in for members of this committee across the summer so that we can familiarise ourselves with what, more with what licensing entails in relation to the private hire and the, and the uh, family parish trade. Okay, that is, is that now, the, that is now the main motion? Yeah, that's, that's fine, that's That's fine, or is that fine as it is? Okay. Right, the amendment we just passed is now the substantive motion, and so we do have to take a, a vote on, on that. So can I see all those in favour of the revised motion? That is unanimous. Thank you very much for that. Um, can I thank officers? I, I do appreciate there's, there's a lot of knowledge um, and experience um, and, and hard work that has gone into this report. Um, it's more a reflection of, of the change over to the committee system and having a committee that has next to no experience of this, this area of work. Um, but we are keen to learn and hopefully this will come back um, and that uh, comments that have been, been made, um, particularly from the, the drivers here, uh, will be taken into account when it does come back to this committee. Thank you very much. I'm now going to ask you to move back to item six, which was skipped over. Um, while it was very good of you to vote me in as the uh, chair for today, um, it it is an item to appoint a deputy chair to regularise a situation that was not ratified at full council. Yeah. Is there any dissent to having Mike, Mike Chaplin um, being the deputy chair of this committee for the rest of this year?
Thank you. Thank you all for that. Um, so, moving on to item 10, um, plan for the 500k budget amendment for street scene improvements. We've only got a few minutes, so uh, can we... It, it's, it, this does seem straightforward. Um, we did get a chance to, to have a look at this before, and is, is there any dissent to this one? Chair, I, I, I think this is, a, is an evolution of policies that I've seen going forward. I, I, I think Ian's doing some great work. If there was any dissent, it's can we uh, try and get um, a service provision, not just focus on cars fly tipping, but also looking at people on feet fly tipping, um, because that, that seems to be the only issues that I'm picking up uh, with regards to the street scene elements uh, of that. But that would be the only dissent I would have here, Chair. I, I'm really sorry, because I know you've done a lot of work on this, but we've we run up against the time buffer. Sorry. Um, I would also add in that it, it was raised right at the start of the meeting by one of the, um, the petitioners was the um, Fix My Street. Can we be sure that the, yeah. um, the 15K that's been set aside for that will be in there? The risk 15 came for that, uh, Chair. Um, what, what I would say is that there has been improvement with the Council's website in the meantime. It's still not 100% perfect, but there has been ongoing work. I think there were some technical issues um, to, to do the full integration. We can receive information through from Fix My Street as an email, but it then has to be re-entered. Um, the hope was that the improvements that have just been done and, and you can upload things and things like that, will be sufficient, but there is still testing going on on it, but there is 15K in this report if it does require some further work. Thank you, Ian. Well, with time moving on, can I take it there's no dissent on? Barbara. Sorry, Barbara. Yeah, just a quick comment. I mean, can I, can you, can I be sure that you're going to evaluate this because it's a one-off and I don't want it to be one-off and everything deteriorate afterwards, that's all. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, there is a commitment in the forward plan that for this and also the project that we have running with the LAX, which is about that transformational reduction on fly tipping and graffiti, that there will be some regular updates. And part of some of the projects we have going on are about better presentation of the data, you know, pulling the information together from many disparate sources. So it's much more visible to, to LAX and, and ward members and, and residents um, of what, what the plan is, you know, what's the strategy for the city to improve, what's the data telling us, where are the incidents happening, and, and you know, where, where are the costs? Um, given the financial situation you heard earlier, it's really important, so yes, I agree. Thank you, Ian, for that. I'm, I'm gonna have to impose another guillotine. I'm, I'm really sorry, Paul. Um, can, <coughs> if any member wishes to dissent on this report, can you please raise your hand? then I take it that we're all agreed so that we can get this, this money to do the work that we really needed to do to, to clean up our streets and, uh, and do all the other things that are in there. Okay. I'm going to defer item 11 um, and that will leave us with work programme. Richard, do you want to comment? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so we've started to develop the forward plan, which you've seen copies of. Um, We've left, it, we've left the sort of forward plan quite light as we get into sort of early next year to, to really reflect what you as councillors want us to bring as officers. Um, so some of the um, ideas we've started to develop with the chair, the lead spokesperson and deputy chair, um, we've got a key one at Christmas parking initiative we need to bring in sort of the latest November um, around options around the Christmas parking. We're proposing doing a policy, a parking policy review. Um, the last one was 2017, so updating that, and we'll incorporate yellow box enforcement, pavement parking op uh, options as well in there. Um, big one, looking at street scene improvements, so linked to the work Ian's, Ian's already said, but proposals and how can radically transform how we manage the street seat across the city. Richard, <laughs> can I just slip in the, the petition that came in earlier about Sheldon Road? Can we make sure that's included in the overview? Thank you. Oh my goodness! You've got. I'm so sorry. It's, it's been quite a job to uh, to manage this. Would you like to say a few words around your petition? I'm 
really sorry about this. Just very, very briefly, we attended the, uh, the meeting of full council to put our petition so the councillors now know what the problem is with Sheldon Road, which is basically that the state of the pavements is so bad that it's impacting seriously on the safety of the residents. We've been informed that a small group of councillors are going to go and have a look at the situation. So obviously we can't, the process can't be advanced until they've done that. So thank you for coming out to have a look at the situation is basically what I want to say. Okay. Yeah, can I say, I did go and see Sheldon Road myself. I was on my way back from a, a, a visit out of, out of the city. So I was, I was down there the Friday before last, um, but I've asked for local councillor Nigar Basharat um, to go in my place on Friday the 1st of July and there'll be Joe Otten who should be fit and well by then long before then um, and and I believe a green councillor will be there as well okay thank okay. you for that thank you okay and Richard thank you chair I'm um, just on, on Sheldon Road so it's, it's currently under the work program I'm um, following the publication of the Sheffield Street Tree Partnership strategy back in May 2021 on streets where trees may need to be considered for replacement ahead of resurfacing works, an online consultation process will take place before any works begin. The consultation process gives residents the opportunity to have the say and challenge decisions around surrounding street trees through an open and transparent process. So that is part of the, the partnership of the Street Tree Strategy Working Group. In autumn 2021, we published an update on the status of all roads and trees where work was halted as the council and Amy work to develop the street tree partnership approach. We will publish a further update after discussion with the street tree partnership, which takes place this Friday. Um, the update will give an indicative timescale for resurfacing works where this is needed. Thank you, Richard. I believe we're now offline, or about to go offline. Just to check, can Richard confirm that that's on today? Yeah. Just confirm the recommendations in the work program yeah. report. Can we confirm the recommendations in the uh, work programme, please? Is that all? Thank you all very much. Um, I'm sorry it's got a bit frenetic towards the end. Um, and I do appreciate your patience today. Uh, it's, it's a learning curve for us all. Thank you all very much.